Good afternoon, everyone. I am Boris Kozniak, a historian and philosopher of science at the Institute of Philosophy here in Zagreb, and I was kindly asked by the organizer to moderate today's debate, which I accepted with great pleasure. The debate focuses on the question, whence and why morality? I believe that we all agree that the question should not be about whether atheists could be moral or good. Uh, since the answer from the experience is yes, in the same manner as uh, they are also immoral believers. The true question is whether atheism gives us rational foundations for the justification of morality. Or to put the point the other way around, in what sense the existence of God justifies the existence of morality? Joining me to debate these questions are Max Baker Hitch, a tutor in philosophy at the Evangelical Theological College Wycliffe Hall, set within the University of Oxford, and Paul Gregorich, a scientific advisor at the Institute of Philosophy here in Zagreb, also an Oxford alumnus. A few words about our debaters. Max received his PhD in philosophy at Oxford University in 2014 yeah, okay, with a dissertation on causal origins of religious belief. His research interests lie at the intersection of analytic philosophy of religion and epistemology, and he has published on such topics as divine hiddenness, religious diversity, etiological challenges to moral and religious beliefs, the nature of rationality and knowledge, and methodological issues concerning the emerging field of analytic theology. Paolo received his PhD also at Oxford University in 2003 with a dissertation on Aristotle's notion of the common sense. His research interests include a wide range of topics in Asian philosophy with a special focus on Aristotle, early modern philosophy and the philosophy of mind, and he has published several books and numerous articles in leading scholarly journals in these fields. He is also a passionate naturalist, an outspoken atheist, and the co-author of the book The Horizons of Atheism. The format of the debate is the following. Our debaters will begin with their opening statements for 10 minutes. Then the 10 minutes rebuttals will follow. After that, I will probably have a question or two for, for them, but the main focus will be on the questions from the audience. Finally, they will offer their closing statements for five minutes each. I heard, Max, in a similar online debate, you said that the debates are strange beasts, mm -hmm. but I am certain that our debate will not be only useful, but also pleasant. So let us begin, Max with your opening statement. Well, firstly, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is my first visit to Croatia, um, and uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying it so far. I've had a very warm welcome, and thank you to Professor Gregorovich for agreeing to do this debate. Um, so, our, to our topic is the nature of morality, and I think it's a topic that is as controversial today as it ever was. Um, I completely agree with um, what Boris said at the start, that um, we, we're not here to debate whether atheists can be moral. Uh, I certainly grant that atheists can be moral. Uh, we're talking about the um, uh, rational justification for the foundations of uh, morality. So um, a philosopher of the mid 20th century called Philip Afoot wrote some words that I find quite striking and that certainly resonate with me about how she reacted um, when she arrived in Oxford at the end of the Second World War, um, when the news of the vast Nazi atrocities was just coming out. And uh, she wrote that, in the face of the news of the concentration camps, I thought it just can't be that morality is the way that the relativists say it is, um, that morality is just the expression of an attitude. For fundamentally, there's no way if one takes this line that one could imagine oneself saying to a Nazi, but we are right and you are wrong, with there being any substance to that statement. So um, it might surprise you to learn that the majority of professional philosophers today, about 60% according to a recent large-scale survey, 
are objectivists about ethics, which is to say they think that ethics is not just a matter of society's attitudes and preferences. Uh, it's not like fashion or musical taste, but rather there are objective truths about right and wrong, about what we ought and ought not to do. Uh, truths that are true whether we like it or not. Now, obviously, the percentage of philosophers that think something isn't itself an argument for thinking that ethics is objective. Um, and by the way, many of those 60% uh, of philosophers who are objectivists are atheists. But I think it should give us pause before we too quickly assume that it's just obvious that ethics is a matter of subjective preference. Let me just briefly suggest a couple of reasons for thinking that ethics is objective. So consider the following question. Um, if everyone thought that burping loudly at the dinner table was polite, would burping loudly at the, day, the dinner table be polite? Um, well, it seems like it would be, um, which suggests that truths about what is polite, about etiquette and what's rude, are ultimately subjective. They depend on our attitudes and beliefs. Let's try another topic. If we all believe that the moon was made of cheese, would it make it true that the moon is made of cheese? Well, it seems like it wouldn't. The facts about the physical composition of the moon are objective. They're independent of what we think about the matter. Now let's try the test with ethics. Um, if everyone believed that torturing children for fun was ethically acceptable, permissible, would torturing children for fun therefore be ethically permissible? Um, I at least, and I think many philosophers want to say no. Um, and I think that's a, a pretty commonly held intuition, which suggests that we at least presuppose that the truths about what is ethically acceptable or not are objective. A second thought is this, um, the notion of moral progress over time, the idea that society's attitudes are capable of improving over time, is hard to make sense of unless ethical truth is objective. Why think so? Well, think of great social reformers like Martin Luther King Jr., instrumental in the civil rights movement in the United States, or William Wilberforce, who spearheaded the abolition of slavery in Britain. So these individuals went against the grain. They went against the prevailing attitudes of their time and place um, in order to bring about a change in attitudes. But um, someone, according to relativism, someone who is out of step with the prevailing attitudes is wrong almost by definition. But that seems very counterintuitive. Most of us are committed to the idea that moral progress is possible and that it has occurred in history through individuals like Martin Luther King Jr. So I want to suggest the notion that moral progress over time occurs presupposes some objective truth of the matter that we're attempting to get closer to. So the question I want to turn to now is, if we suppose that ethical truths are indeed objective, which um, metaphysical worldview, that is, which overarching picture of the nature of reality, best makes sense of the objectivity of ethics? And what I want to suggest is the, the objectivity of ethics fits better, I don't want to say it's impossible in a naturalistic picture, but I think it fits better and more comfortably in a, on a worldview in which mind, purpose, and personhood are at the foundation of reality, rather than being a, <clears throat> a later kind of accidental byproduct. So let me sketch three reasons for thinking this. So firstly, it seems that the existence of truths that are prescriptive, that is, truths that say how the world should be, and are not merely descriptive, describing how the world is, uh, the existence of truths of, of that sort would be quite odd in a fundamentally in, impersonal and purposeless universe. So again, ethical truths are about <clears throat> not how the world is, but how the world should be. It's not a, ethics is not about describing how the world is. And so it would be strange, I suggest to you, um, if there were truths about how the world should be, written into the fabric of an ultimately mindless, purposeless universe. A second thing I want to suggest is that uh, an atheistic or naturalistic worldview has a harder time 
than a theistic worldview at explaining how our minds would have reliable access to moral truths. So a philosopher called Sharon Street has recently argued that um, even if there are objective moral truths, we can't come to know anything about them because the physical processes that shaped our moral intuitions and beliefs um, weren't kind of aimed at getting us to have true beliefs, so to speak, but rather just in getting us to have moral beliefs that are biologically useful and so on. And so she argues it would be a very lucky coincidence if humans wound up with moral beliefs that accurately line up with the objective moral truths. Now, what I want to suggest is that Street may well be correct that this is how things would be if atheism is true. However, if God exists, then no lucky coincidence would be required um, in our coming to have moral beliefs, <clears throat> at least a common core of, uh, of moral intuitions that uh, approximately track the objective moral truths. A third and final thing I want to say is that I think the notion of universal human rights um, enshrined uh, in the, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights um, is considerably more at home on a theistic picture than an atheistic picture. So that is the idea that every single human being has inherent value and dignity fits better um, with a theistic picture. And I would even suggest specifically with the Judeo-Christian picture. There have been various attempts at grounding the notion of universal human dignity without reference to God. But I want to suggest that the difficulty with these accounts is that they end up saying that human value resides in a certain capacity or ability. For instance, rationality, intelligence, self-awareness. The great German philosopher of the Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant, held that human beings, uh, the value of human beings ultimately resided in our, in our capacity for autonomy, uh, if you like, to govern ourselves. But the problem is that not all humans have that capacity to the same degree, and some barely have it at all. You know, severely mentally disabled people, people with degenerative brain diseases, tiny babies, are seriously lacking such capacities. Must we therefore conclude that they have less moral value than other human beings? That these sorts of human beings are dispensable? And that is the conclusion that the great atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche reached. Um, and he suggested that without the Judeo-Christian metaphysical worldview, one doesn't have a basis for universal human dignity. And indeed, most cultures and civilizations throughout history, including the great civilizations of the Greeks and the Romans, um, did not believe in universal human dignity and equality. And what a number of historians, uh, including some very notable secular historians, such as most recently Tom Holland, have argued with force, I think, is that there was something unique and quite radical about the Christian claim that every human being is precious in virtue of being loved by God. And more than that, that God values the weak and the sick and the poor to such an extent that he would take the form of a human being, namely Jesus of Nazareth, and allow himself to be subjected to the death that was ordinarily reserved in the Roman Empire for slaves and rebels, namely crucifixion. Okay, so just to summarize briefly then, I've suggested that firstly, um, we, we ought to uh, be objectivists about ethics. Secondly, I've suggested that objectivism, whilst not uh, completely in impossible on an atheistic picture, is, uh, fits more comfortably on a theistic view. And finally, I've suggested that the notion of universal human rights and dignity uh, is more at home on a theistic and indeed specifically Judeo-Christian picture. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Now, I haven't, I haven't prepared a speech like Max did. Uh, that's because I just learned today that I was a former dean of theological faculty at the University of Zagreb, uh, Czech Ha Alter. Uh, they say that I was a former dean of theological faculty, so I should know these things. Uh, 
which means that I can then be relaxed in delivering what I uh, what I think is is the case here. Well, I think the case here is I would I would pinpoint uh, the notion of objectivism in in Marx's uh, talk. In one way, I agree with what he says that uh, ethics and the ethics deals with ob objective propositions or propositions of which have some objective value, but I'm not sure that I would agree with his understanding of what this entails. So Marx said that uh, objectivism is about whether things are independent of an individual's view or attitude. And I think things can be independent of an individual's view or attitude, and in that sense be objective, without therefore being eternal, without therefore being universal, without therefore being unchangeable. So it is, I'm not a relativist about ethics, um, as in, in the sense of being indi relativist, individualist relativist, but I do think uh, that uh, moral norms depend on communities, um, on, I would say, human beings, not necessarily human beings, um, but are something that is culturally uh, dependent. Is it therefore merely subjective? No, it's not merely subjective, because it's not, it's not up to me, but it is up to my community, and it is how I'm where I'm brought up, how I'm brought up, uh, that shapes my sense of what is right and wrong and my views, uh, rational views on what is right and wrong. So <clears throat> I tend to think that uh, human morality is, has Darwinian reasons for existence and uh, Darwinian explanation, ultimately, we know that um, there are Darwinian evolutionary reasons for being good to each other and to act with kindness to each other. And, I mean, the most obvious case is of genetic kinship, uh, where it is a matter of transmission of genes. Now, that can be on an individual level, it can be on the level of kin selection, and somewhat more controversially at the, level of, at the level of group selection. There is also such a thing as reciprocal um, altruism, which has been evidenced in uh, more than a dozen other species of animals, whereby showing kindness to another uh, individual or a series of individual, uh, individuals kind of has a payoff uh, then the similar sort of kindness is shown to you too. I mean, among the bats, for instance. So it's not only the primates that have that kind of uh, what we could call uh, proto-moral uh, behavior. And there is also something that is called virtue advertising with its, again, evolutionary payoffs or payoffs in terms of fitness, which is also evidenced uh, in other species. So I would tend to think that uh, humans uh, are, as in, in terms of biology, as organisms, uh, are not a separate class from the rest of the living world. And I also think that patterns of social behavior uh, among humans should be also on the same sort of continuum uh, with the similar social behavior that can be seen in other animals. Now, if that's true, uh, if there is a, a continuum there, that means that we don't really need God or some heavy-duty metaphysical machinery uh, to ground uh, moral behavior, because, I mean, something like that can be seen um, in other species. So, <clears throat> Basically, theists will say that it is very difficult to conceive of, or it is easier to conceive within a theist uh, uh, paradigm, uh, 
moral motivation. So you can be, it's how can you be um, motivated to be moral unless there is heaven and hell? Uh, well, Ernst Bloch would say that in that case, you need to be, an, you must be an atheist in order to be moral <coughs> because otherwise you're just going along with, uh, with fear of punishment or with a desire for a reward. And that's not that's not morality. Uh, moral motivation has a different form also. I mean, this argument for moral motivation has the form of the argument that unless there is a higher purpose to the universe and if there is a higher purpose to humans and their actions, then all moral behavior will be meaningless. <coughs> Um, I, I disagree with that because it seems to me that moral behavior has its ultimate rationale in uh, our interactions with other human beings in various circles of our social lives uh, and that's where it derives its meaningfulness from. If I was a, if I was a solipsist, if, or if I was a sole uh, individual in the whole universe, whether I know it or not, uh, then I don't think that morality um, would exist. Okay, so moral truths. Are there moral truths if there is no, um, if there is no um, a divine grind grounding for it? Yes, why not? There are moral truths, uh, only they are not eternal, they are not unchangeable, and they are not uh, universal, but they depend on various, they depend on different contexts. And this is a, an important thing for me uh, to point out, that morality must be such as to be capable of changing and improving. In the past 200 years, I believe, there we have seen a lot of moral progress. Now, if, if morality is grounded in objective, universal, never-changing truths, then this wouldn't be possible, would it? So some, but if you agree with me that, in, that there is moral improvement, then you cannot uh, subscribe to the, to the idea that uh, moral truths are eternal, objective, universal, uh, and not susceptible uh, to revision. And then finally, there is this notion of moral agency. Like, um, would, if, so the idea is this, if I live in a determinist world, and if all my actions are just a result of the previous state of states of the world plus natural laws that govern it, then there is no room for a moral agency, which means that we have to believe in free will, in soul, uh, in some supernatural causation, which allows us to step out of the natural world in order to provide real agency. Now, I don't think uh, that's, that's the case. I think there can be moral agency within uh, the naturalist uh, paradigm. Uh, and, but it does require some sort of, I, I do think that it requires some sort of soft compatibilism. Uh, so I wouldn't go down the um, uh, incompatibilism road. Okay, so to summarize my, my position, I do agree that one's ethical views in their justification will ultimately depend on one's metaphysical views. And that is why I think it is important for uh, a theist to have his grounding, but also for a non-theist to have his grounding uh, of morality. So, um, some kind of secular uh, foundation or atheist foundation or naturalist foundation for mor morality uh, is an important thing. And we can find plenty of examples uh, of that, uh, especially in, um, in other philosophical traditions. Uh, 
uh, one of them being early uh, Hinayana Buddhism, uh, but a closer one is, for instance, Democritus. Uh, Democritus and Epicurus had, uh, I believe, what can be called um, a naturalistic ethics. Uh, I would even go as far as to say that Aristotle's ethics is naturalistic insofar as it does not uh, depend in any way on any notion of God or on any existence of supernatural um, uh, entities. So um, we have two worldviews. These worldviews are different. Uh, they have different metaphysical found foundations. From there, there is, it follows that they have different epistemological foundations, but then they have uh, also different ethics, different anthropologies, very often different politics uh, as well. Uh, but that's fine. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we're turning to, to, to Max. I, I believe that you have many points of Paolo's uh, <coughs> opening statements to, to address. Okay, thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, great. I'll try and say something about all of the key points you brought up. Okay, so, but not necessarily in the order you brought them up. Um, so, firstly, let me just mention quickly. Um, so, Pavel, you mentioned that some theists say that atheists have a weaker moral motivation. Um, just to clarify, they, some theists do say that, I don't say that, so that, that's not an argument I'm using. And, and nor am I trying to anchor the foundations of morality in divine sanction or pun, you know, the idea that we have to avoid punishment. That's not how I'm trying to, to do things. Um, okay, so then I think on to the more substantive thing. So um, Pavel uh, sort of agreed in a qualified way that there's some kind of objectivity in ethics. Um, I think I might have to ask for a bit more clarification here. Um, but it, it does seem to me that um, the, the, the sort of uh, meta-ethical view that Pavel ended up describing does end up sounding more or less like what those philosophers in the literature who call themselves constructivists or relativists uh, would hold. Um, so Pavel said, um, you know, moral norms uh, depend on communities, so they are culturally dependent. They're, cu they're dependent on our upbringing and ultimately, I think you even said on, on what my society says. And I think uh, what I would like to say in response to that is that it, it isn't an, an adequate grounding for many of the moral commitments that we do all in fact hold. So just for example, there are many societies in the world today that think that uh, female circumcision is perfectly acceptable and, and in, indeed a good thing to do. There are societies in the world today where um, it is thought that women shouldn't be educated, at least not to the same level as men. Maybe they shouldn't be allowed to drive. Uh, they, they basically should not have the same rights as men. There are real, this isn't just a philosophical thought experiment, there are real places in the world today that think this. You could push the thought experiment, and you know, uh, the Nazis could actually have won World War II fairly easily if a few strategic decisions had gone a bit differently. We could be living in a world now where it, we all have been brought up to think that uh, eugenics is a good thing, um, that uh, killing the weak at birth is, is what is the right and proper thing to do, and you know, I could go on. So in other words, to say, as Pavel says, that um, ethics is ultimately a matter of what my, the, the sort of consensus my society comes to, commits me to saying that I basically can't criticize these, uh, these societies. At least, I, I mean, I may be able to stand here and say, well, my society doesn't like female circumcision, but to those people who find themselves in a society that does approve of those things, there really is no basis for criticizing them. And then I think this is the point that Philippa Foote was making when she said that this view is just not good enough. And by the way, Philippa Foote's not a theist. Um, she was making the point that if, if we adopt this view that says, um, you know, ethics ultimately is culturally dependent in, in the sorts of ways Pavel suggested, uh, it is very difficult to ultimately say what's wrong with the kinds of practices that I just enumerated. Okay, moving on to um, the claim that there's a Darwinian explanation for morality. 
Now, in a sense, I'm perfectly happy with this. I, I don't deny uh, Darwinian evolution. Um, and Pavel you know, enumerated various facets of this explanation. There, there seem to be uh, you know, ways in which um, altruistic behavior conduces to social uh, flourishing and so on. Um, and, and I'm perfectly happy with all that, really. And, and I would just uh, say, you know, in fact, if I was forced to say that morality always went contrary to what's good for the flourishing of society, I think that would be an odd view for me to hold as a theist. So, of course, I as a theist want to say that uh, morality um, does ultimately conduce to the flourishing of society. So it's hardly surprising that we should be able to generate these sorts of explanations. But I do want to stress a distinction that is very important and which often gets ignored in these kinds of discussions about evolutionary explanations of morality. And it's a distinction between explanation of a behavior or belief and justification of a behavior or belief. So just because we can explain why we have the belief that murder is wrong or whatever, and we, have a, you know, we, we tend to avoid murdering people, that doesn't, in and of itself, that tells us nothing, or at least there's no logically valid inference from that to the conclusion that murder is therefore ethically wrong. Uh, much more has to be said. There's no automatic inference. Um, and, and I would just say as well, we can generate evolutionary explanations of all kinds of things. Um, and actually, the, the whole field of evolutionary psychology, which specializes in trying to give evolutionary explanations of human behavior, uh, I don't mean to criticize evolutionary biology as a whole, but evolutionary psychology that tries to say, for instance, boys prefer blue because yada yada it was beneficial to survival for this reason that field has come under significant criticisms uh, for the ways in which it generates these rather kind of untestable hypotheses and I would I, I would add as well we can generate we can come up with these kind of evolutionary stories for instance for why scientists have a preference for simple and elegant theories we can come up with an evolutionary story for why that would be biologically helpful to do that does that mean that we've therefore kind of debunked and undermined the practice of choosing scientific theories? I don't think so. And so I would want to say just because we can generate these sorts of biological stories about why altruistic behavior is conducive to survival, it, it in no way undermines uh, <clears throat> the, the ethical status. Uh, or, or I should say in no way shows that there isn't an objective truth. Um, Okay, um, moving on to um, the thought. Yes, yeah, so Pavel talked about this idea of moral progress, which I also touched on. And I think here I, I do want to say almost the exact opposite to Pavel, namely that if we have a view of ethics that says it's, it, ethics is anchored to what culture says at a given point in time, we actually can't make sense of the notion of moral progress. And the reason, again, is that if we say what society deems appropriate at a given time is what is right, then we're forced to say that someone like Martin Luther King or William Wilberforce was in the wrong at the time that they tried to bring about their reforms. And that's not, I think, what we want to say if we believe in moral progress, as I certainly do. So as I said, I think, that the, I, I think what Pavel means is that moral beliefs are capable of changing, and of course I, I grant that. Um, but <clears throat> actually, if we want, if pr the idea of progress suggests that there's some, some goal that we're moving towards, and I would suggest the goal is having beliefs that accurately line up with the objective truths. And in fact, we, we can't make sense of moral progress if we say the moral truth is whatever society deems at a given point in time. Um, <clears throat> okay, determinism and free will. Um, I think Pavel seemed to be suggesting that the, um, the sort of objectivist or, or at least the theist uh, needs to say that we have libertarian free will, what philosophers sometimes call counter-causal free will, so that I, when I make a free choice, um, the, all of the universe, uh, you know, all of the, the happenings in the universe up till that point don't fix what my choice will be the moment after. Now, a lot of theists do hold to libertarian free will, but actually many don't, and many significant figures in theological tradition 
uh, were not libertarians about free will. Um, <clears throat> Augustine, Luther, Calvin, just to name a few. They held to what's known as compatibilism, which says that having moral responsibility and free will in a significant sense is compatible with uh, our actions having causes prior to them that determine them. And I'm basically not taking a stance on that in this debate. All I'm saying is the, the theist does not need to uh, be committed to libertarian free will, as I think Pavel seemed to suggest. <clears throat> um, then I think finally I would just uh, again reiterate the, the thought that I closed my um, opening speech with, again this thought that universal human dignity, human rights, something I think most of us probably believe in, um, are not easy to, to ground on a secular picture. And, and I don't think that the picture that Pavel has offered us gives any way <clears throat> to ground the universality of uh, human dignity and worth, apart from traits of strength, intelligence, and so on, and what society deems worthwhile. Thank you. Justification of individual moral positions or propositions uh, does not need to have a justification. Does not, does not need to derive from what is going on in a particular society. So here's what I here's what I have in mind. So Socrates. Uh, went against the popular morality of his own time. Uh, why? Because he wanted to see moral improvement of his society. He thought that there are ways, he was pretty certain that there are ways in which the morality, in which his society, in which he lived, uh, can be uh, improved. Now it is true uh, that with Socrates, this comes with a certain metaphysical baggage, at least as, as, as far as, as long as we believe Plato uh, in what Socrates uh, thought was the case. Um, envisioning the, the idea of the good or the form of justice which needs to be, uh, that's, the, that's, the easier, that's the easier way. So when we think today why uh, female circumcision uh, is wrong, I trust that we do that on the basis of moral intuitions that society should be as welcoming uh, to everyone regardless of gender, regardless of the situation, regardless of one's uh, social standing, etc, etc, etc. So you are looking from a certain position which you have, which you have inherited having being brought up in a Western liberal society and then looking into uh, the other society, thinking how that society might be improved in that way or in another. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, regardless of this talk of objective truths, I mean, we haven't heard from Max a single absolute moral truth such that once this truth was reached, there would be no more moral progress. So what is one absolute moral truth? One that is unconditional. So where have we ever found it? Those shalt not kill, is, is that one? Uh, well, it uh, depends. Uh, I don't think that this is an absolute um, imperative. If you are threatened by someone and the only way to defend yourself is by taking that person's life, you are justified in taking that person's life. I take it. And in many uh, moralities, uh, perhaps, perhaps not some orthodox ones or not some extreme pacifist ones, um, you would be justified in doing that. So w what are these absolutes? I'd like to see one. Second, once I hear what it is, how can we be sure that it is an absolute? Where do I have to derive my knowledge from in order to confirm that this is absolute truth? How do I know that? Is it by revelation or is it uh, by some interior moral light that I, that I have?
Yes, I agree that um, uh, evolutionary psychology uh, has had some facile explanations, but I think this was uh, uh, this was time uh, gone by uh, twenty years ago, uh, ten years ago. Now it is a more, I think, more rigorous uh, field of study, and I don't think that we can say ah they have only just so stories. Uh, they're not just so stories. Many of them uh, have been uh, have been tested. Uh, Jonathan Hyde is one of the uh, uh, evolutionary psychologists or evolutionary moralists or moral psychologists uh, who I have I, I have reasons to believe uh, have given us uh, quite valid uh, scientific data. All right. Uh, David Hume is one of my favorite philosophers. I failed to mention him. I think his morality is utterly secular uh, and he stresses something called empathy, uh, which is also um, stressed by Darwin uh, in his reflections on morality towards the end of his book, The Descent of Man. Uh, Empathy as being um, a, a, a feeling of a feeling of compassion, which which brings some kind of cement uh, uh, between uh, two individuals, and then uh, spilling over to the rest of the rest of the society. Yes, uh, so training in empathy is a sort of moral education and a very powerful one. Uh, I hear that, for instance, in Denmark, we have schools and where one of the aims of the curriculum is to uh, foster empathy towards uh, a, a better understanding among individuals. Something, something like that, I think, is a very powerful thing. Because ultimately, I think that being moral does not depend on being intelligent, it does not depend on knowing a lot or uh, knowing the right sorts of things or making the right sorts of uh, judgments. Uh, it has something to do, uh, it has more to do with habituation, uh, with um, uh, upbringing, and with honing these, uh, these intuitions. And yes, they will be cross-cultural very often, uh, and they should be uh, cross-cultural very often. Uh, so when we think about uh, um, uh, moral norms in other societies, and when we see that there are discrepancies, I think that is that is that is a good thing. And then uh, to see what is wrong from their standpoint, uh, what other uh, propositions are involved, and ultimately you will be led to a set of very fundamental uh, metaphysical and epistemological. Uh, beliefs, and it is important to discuss this, uh, these beliefs. I mean, ultimately, either God exists or he doesn't exist. Either there are supernatural beings or there are no supernatural beings, and uh, and a lot depends on how you, which way you go. Okay, I think that we have already arrived at the questions and answers <coughs> part of the debate. So I will let Max to answer the questions Pavel posed. Oh, okay. Um, Pavel's wanted a, an example of a, an objective truth that won't be revised further. Just here's a quick example. Um, one ought not to to torture children for fun. Is that likely to be revised? I, I doubt it. But the other thing I wanted to say is that I think also what Pavel is somewhat trading on here is that it's hard to come up with... Uh, so there's a distinction philosophers draw between first-order ethics and meta-ethics. Okay, so meta-ethics is the question of, is, there, is morality objective? How do we know about it? And that, this is really what we've been discussing today. But I think what Pavel is kind of getting at is that in first-order ethics, which is where we try to see if we can come up, we can s figure out a general principle that tells us what to do in any situation. Now there's utilitarianism, there's Kantian theories, and, and we know that there are difficulties with all of these. Does that mean there's no objective truth of the matter? I don't think so. Let me just give a quick analogy with science. Science is changing all the time in terms of what it postulates about 
objective reality. Um, so, you know, um, we had uh, a while ago, we used to think that uh, space time was absolute with Newton. Now we know from Einstein that it's, uh, that it's not. Um, now, I think if we were to carry the analogy over from what Pavel's wanting to say about morality, um, Pavel would seem to be forced to say that the world itself is changing as our scientific theories progress. But of course, that's not what we should say. What we say is that our scientific theories are changing because we're getting incrementally closer to the objective truth. That's what I want to say about ethics. Um, the fact that it's hard to figure out a general principle that doesn't end up getting revised tells us something about our, the limitations of our, our knowledge, our epistemic access to moral truth. But it doesn't follow from that that ethical truth itself is determined by what we think. So um, now Pavel asks, where do, I, where do we derive ethical knowledge? Now, I don't think I'm committed to saying that it's some kind of really spooky thing. Um, Pavel actually did mention moral intuitions, um, and I do think that moral intuitions are a source of um, moral knowledge. I think, and this is something I touched on earlier, I think that the theist has an easier time explaining why our moral intuitions would like, be likely to be trustworthy and, and to track objective moral truths than the atheist does. Um, but I think it is um, the theistic picture and the Christian picture in particular, which I subscribe to, wants to say not only is there this moral knowledge which is given through moral intuitions, um, there is this claim that God himself came in the form of a human being to show to us in concrete form what the good life looks like. Um, and I think, you know, just as a purely historical claim, one that many secular historians would agree with, the ethics of the Sermon, of the Mount, Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave has profoundly shaped uh, our society today, just as a, as a purely historical matter. Um, I think uh, that, oh, finally, yes, David Hume and empathy. Um, so David Hume, if I understand correctly, um, thought that morality was not ultimately a matter of making statements about, you know, um, what is and is what is right and what is wrong. Uh, Hume thought that morality was ultimately an expression of attitudes, um, a little bit like the way that um, you know we have tastes and preferences when it comes to food. But of course, Hume recognised that you know it's not so just dependent on what I think and you think. We, there is some sense that we all have in common uh, certain ethical tastes. But so this position is known as non-cognitivism. Hume thought that there isn't, it's not a matter of uh, ethical truth at all, actually. It's simply expressions of sentiments. Um, now, empathy, um, I want to say, is, is a wonderful thing. Um, empathy um, motivates us to, um, to do what we ought to do. Um, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with Pavel. I think it's something we should try to foster. Um, but I think I simply go back to the, the question about what is the story uh, Pavel has to tell us about why we, th why we should think that empathy is a good thing, uh, simply pointing to the fact that we have this capacity for empathy, as Hume does, doesn't in itself tell us anything about uh, its ethical status. For any absolute truth that somebody is going to give you, uh, you can make, a, for instance, consequentialist or utilitarian counter-argument. So it goes like this. So if you had a choice between enabling someone to torture a child for fun, and if that was the only condition in which you can save 10,000 people from alien inva invasion and being tortured or whatever you wanted to do, are you morally obligated to do it? So, are you going to tolerate a torture for fun of one child for saving 10,000 people? Now, utilitarians are going to say, well, yes, no, not only that it is morally, uh, it, you know, you, you sh that's, the way, that's the way to go, uh, because otherwise you are actually killing or, or facilitating uh, 10,000 people uh, to be tortured. I mean, these are, 
These are, of course, counterfactual scenarios, and we can go endlessly uh, about them, uh, but they are supposed to just show that there are situations in which you are going not to be so sure about what you proclaim to be uh, a, an absolute, uh, absolute truth. Uh, okay, so that's one thing. The other thing uh, about Christian morality uh, Sermon on the Mount, yeah, well, yes, that's all very nice. Uh, but there is also a line in Matthew which I find really uh, resentful um, uh, and downright nasty, uh, which Christ says, Ho meon metemu katemu estin. The one who is not with me is against me. Now, I don't think this is a, this is a, an, an attitude I would regard as moral. You're either with me or you're against me, for instance. Uh, but then again, a lot, of, uh, a lot of theology has been cherry picking. So I take some things and forget about the others. Uh, empathy, Hume says, is, is society promoting emotion. So this is something that keeps um, uh, keep society together rather than turning it into a bunch of beasts. Uh, so the justification for uh, empathy is that it is a social sentiment, uh, inherently social sentiment. Uh, if, uh, unless you have it, you are not going to be uh, uh, a good or a cooperative member of the society, unless, of course, there is some penalty uh, that you would, that you are then guided uh, in your behavior to avoid. Well, okay, brief, I'll just say this very briefly. So, yes, yeah, so, so Pavel, um, just back to this issue of an objective moral truth that isn't going to be revised. So Pavel rightly points out that you know utilitarians will disagree with Kantians about you know I gave an example, torturing children for fun is wrong or torturing children for fun is bad. Now Pavel rightly points out that the utilitarian will say, but if torturing a child for fun would save a city of a million, then the utilitarian will say that's what you should do. But here's the thing, the, even the utilitarian agrees that it's a bad state of affairs for a child to be tortured for fun. And they think that, that, that there is this intrinsic badness. They just think that the consequences can on occasion outweigh, that there can be even worse consequences that outweigh the badness. But the thing that the Kantian and the utilitarian agree on is that in and of itself, you know, isolating it from the consequences, it is a bad thing. Um, and. And that, let me say that's my candidate example for uh, an objective moral truth and that I think as far as I can tell everyone agrees on and I, I don't think that that's likely to be overturned. And again just back to the point that the fact that it is difficult to arrive at a general theory that tells us in every situation the sort of formula to work out what you should do, I, and it is difficult, I don't think it follows from that that, the, that we abandon the idea that, objecti that ethics is objective. No more so than the fact that in science it's hard to arrive at theories that are never going to be overturned uh, in 50 years' time means that we think that the world itself, the physical world, is not objective. Yes, we can agree that it is a bad state of affairs, uh, but for different reasons. Uh, so a Kantian will say this is a bad state of affairs because torturing a child is uh, basically quenching or destroying uh, the, even the possibility of a person becoming an autonomous agent. And then a uh, utilitarian is going to say, well, it's a bad state of affair because it causes a lot of suffering and this suffering is unnecessary. And what I like about a utilitarian position is that this suffering in involves only that this is a sentient being, not that it is an intelligent being. So that uh, on this utilitarian grounds, you would also say that it's a, it's a bad state of affair if you uh, uh, torture a cat or even a fly. Whereas on Kantian, that, well, pff, well doesn't really matter because they're not autonomous agents, they're not persons. And it's not suffering, it's autonomy. 
So there are different, I mean, there are different ways to go uh, analyzing this, how, how, how bad it is and why it is bad. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Max. And now we will take questions from the audience. I believe that we would have an opportunity to continue the debate. Okay. So first, I actually have two questions in part of my English. Uh, it might not be in the best shape. Um, first question is actually for Professor Grevich. Um Proposition, I would say that proposition, uh, it's one ought not to torture child for fun is universally true. So that is universal moral truth. And if you say, uh, and if you put it into a utilitarian dilemma as you did, uh, it becomes a completely different proposition. One ought not torture child for fun in order to save a million lives. That's not the same position anymore. So you have to, you have a different position. You have a, you have a, you have a dilemma. One ought not torture a child for fun. That's not a dilemma. So uh, I think that one would, you know, always actually agree with that proposition. And here's actually a second <coughs> question. Sorry, this is taking too long. A uh, second question for Professor, uh, sorry, yes, for uh, Baker Hitch. That's correct. Um, if you if you, if you look at the the, the rightness or uh, truth in that proposition, one one ought not torture the child for fun. In first step, uh, why is that universally true? Uh, if you look at the data, the scientific data that uh, Professor Jonathan Haidt uh, showed uh, in numerous books, um, it shows that we humans, uh, through 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 the ages, yeah. developed in a certain way, and uh, we developed in such a way that we know that good life, you know, uh, uh, certain patterns of behavior lead to good life. Mm -hmm. And when we think about moral improvement, we think about good life, we follow certain uh, social practice, we, uh, uh, we follow certain personal practice and uh, interpersonal, interpersonal uh, relations. So from that perspective, if, if the ultimate question of, of uh, ethics is uh, how one should live, how one ought to live, and how one should live, and if you have the moral uh, evolutionary perspective, which tells you certain patterns of behavior, culturally, individually, interpersonally, leads to uh, uh, a prosperous living, then why do you need to invoke God? I mean, I'm, I'm a theist, by the way, so maybe you could help me out. Why do I need God in the picture if, you know, uh, you know culturally, uh, different cultures, you know, there's a great overlap, you know, we all, you know, there's a human universal, universal, yeah, yeah, you know, we all, you know, more or less, if we live in a similar way, we're going to feel good, we're going to prosper. And, you know, Western society is, you know, I wouldn't say the most developed society. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we tend to empathize, yeah. you know, we really empathize. We see this as something good, but that's, you know, but that's all based somewhat in our, in our emotions, in our intuitions, which are evolutionary <laughs> explicable. So, why do I need God to, you know, to, to live a good life, to know what's true? Mm -hmm. Okay, so sorry. That's fine. Shall I go first? Or? Uh, I think that's... I, I, I can go first. So I agree that these are two different propositions uh, and uh, the, the, uh, they will be evaluated differently again by ver various ethical systems, right? So the proposition uh, one ought not to, to um, uh, torture a child uh, is something that utilitarian is going to agree with as much as a, 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 a theorist of uh, deontology or a virtue ethicist, but the explanation is going to be different. Now you say, w once we put a proposition in the following way as a conditional, well, it's either that or you're going to kill uh, one million people, uh, thereby you have a different, yes, you have a different proposition, but its validity or its persuability should be absolute in the case of absolute morality. So, uh, so no amount of possible world scenarios should be allowed to soften the imperative of going with that proposition. So if this is an absolute truth, if, if in, a, in a possible world that was a case where you could or could not, you could allow or not allow uh, a, a one child to be uh, 
tortured for the sake of saving uh, a million people. Does that, does that make torturing a child fun, right? Well, in this case, it makes it the option that you have, you, you are morally obligated to take, whether it makes it right, so you're choosing between two evils, right? Obviously, in on any account of ethics, I take it you're choosing between two evils. But in one case, it's going to say this is absolute and you're never going to choose it because it's an absolute uh, 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 injunc injunction. Uh, and in another system, you're going to say, no, it's not an absolute. There, no, there are no absolute truths. And that, see, that is a big game changer if you give up absolute truths. Um, okay, I'll just briefly remark on that. I mean, um, I think I like the way you phrased the question. I mean, um, we're in a sense con considering different propositions when we consider a, the, the proposition one ought not to, to torture a child for fun when it produces no beneficial consequences um, of any kind, um, and the proposition one ought to uh, one ought not to uh, torture a child for fun even if it produces beneficial consequences such as saving a million. Now, I, I think. Um, what I, I thought you were suggesting, and I agree with, is that those propositions, um, well, I certainly want to say are objectively true. Um, <clears throat> I think Pavel would probably agree that the proposition that one ought not to ch torture a child for fun, you know, where we d build into that proposition that it doesn't have these beneficial consequences, that is objectively absolutely true, and I can't see it ever being overturned. One more thing I would just say about this is that I think, again, there is you know, it is hard to come up with these general theories that systematize all our moral intuitions. But at the same time, what you seem to find is, even cross-culturally, there is a considerable amount of agreement on what we should do in particular cases. And so I, I think it's not the case that we just have this complete stalemate where, uh, to, so, I mean, and before you stepped into the philosophy classroom, um, many of you would probably have the same ethical judgments about a, a wide range of particular cases. It's the, the, th the, the attempt to systematize those judgments w which is difficult. But I, I, as I've said before, there's no inference from that to the, that there is no objective truth. Um, <clears throat> in terms of um, some, some commonly shared sense of human flourishing that we all have, I think it's easy to, to overstate that a little bit. And as I, I think I've tried to suggest earlier, there are, um, there are considerably different notions of what it might mean for um, human beings to flourish. For instance, Nazi eugenics, which could have prevailed. And so if we want to say, you know, um, what's true ethically is that human flourishing is good. That, if you like, is the kind of master ethical truth and we figure out everything else from that. Um, <clears throat> I, I think I'd want to say we have to be careful with that because, and, and Philippa Foote, who is a, a kind of Aristotelian philosopher who tried to develop an ethical theory along these lines. I mean, one difficulty that I think she runs into is that it, it well, here's, here's one issue. How do we weigh up the um, competing flourishing of different species? Another issue is that there, there seem to be <clears throat> uh, circumstances, possible circumstances in which uh, what conduces to human flourishing is actually something that we probably would regard as abhorrent. So um, I think Philip Kitcher has, has suggested, you know, if there, there could be a scenario where humanity is on the verge of going extinct unless it procreates very quickly. It seems like in those circumstances, it, what conduces to human flourishing could be something very unpleasant. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, rape, for example, could be what, what allows humanity to procreate quickly enough. Do we want to say that that would be ethically obligatory? I certainly wouldn't want to say that. So I, that's why I think just trying to anchor ethics in a notion of human flourishing and saying we get all the goods just from that, I, I think is, um, is not ultimately going to work. Yeah, question. Uh, thank you. I have a question from professor, for Professor Pava, but uh, Professor Baker can also comment. Uh, I would appreciate it. Uh, you said that <coughs> ethics or morality and uh, intelligence, uh, that morality does not depend on intelligence. I would briefly like to challenge that uh, because it seems to me, and I would like to hear your comment, that more intelligent people have a 
greater capacity to predict the outcome of their actions, and therefore a greater responsibility to think about it, and therefore they have the greater capacity to be more. A greater responsibility, not the capacity, a greater responsibility to be more. Because uh, intellectual honesty or dishonesty exists exactly because of that. You can uh, sort of not think far enough just to satisfy, uh, for example, uh, what people expect of you and for to justify something that you did. Although you know, and it will be enough for your community, although you know that the consequences of it would be... Uh. I am not sure that there is even a correlation between intelligence and morality, let alone a, a causal relation between them. I think we can adduce a number of instances where you have very intelligent people being uh, morally rather uh, ill-minded, and you can you can have some very well uneducated or um, not particularly high mensa IQ scoring uh, people who do behave uh, rather morally so so I don't think that there there, sh there is even correlation I mean if we look factually now uh, I wonder if you wanted to talk about normatively whether being intelligent somehow imposes extra uh, moral Yes. yes, yes that's my ah, wh whether it ah, okay. It, it, so it, it makes you more responsible. Whether it makes you more responsible. Hmm. Okay. Well, I would need to think about this. But one one way to say one reason to say yes is is the following: uh, the um, being more educated. Let's not talk about intelligence because I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but being more educated, certainly, if this, if you've if you've received education uh, uh, of uh, which is like higher education from your society, I mean, in a way, you have to pay it back. In that sense, maybe that imposes extra um, uh, requirements uh, on you, just because just because society has given you something, you are a beneficiary of something that not everyone has. In a way, you have to uh, pay it off somehow. I don't, I, but I don't, I don't know. This is a complex. This is a complex thing. I just want to. I just want to say that I don't think that direct uh, 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 causal and even a correlation uh, between intelligence and morality. I think I agree with what Pavel said. I'd like to ask Professor Pavel to comment on Max's comment from the previous question, which was um, there are some potential instances where um, what causes most human flourishing wouldn't necessarily be regarded as what is moral. So the instance of potentially mass rape that would be required for um, the propagation of um, humanity, or maybe in another situation you might say a, a spouse that remains faithful to their partner even though they are infertile and that would therefore not be products to, for their own um, kind of human flourishing beyond their own generation, but would still be seen probably as a good thing that they were faithful to each other and didn't just ditch them and go off with someone else. Um, how would you respond to that? So there are two different examples yeah. here, right? So as to the as to the second example, uh, the reason to be the reason still to be faithful, although the other person to, to an, is your, your your partner is infertile, would be, uh, um, I mean, a, a whole range of of things. I mean, it can be bound in just plain emotion that you have for this for this person. Secondly, you can by uh, by standing together with your your partner. Uh, you are uh, manifesting a certain way of life or your system of values, and you want that. To, to, it's a kind of virtue signaling, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, an acceptable thing. Uh, as for the as for the for the f uh, for the first uh, instance with uh, with with mass rape um, as being as leading to a, a beneficiary uh, beneficial outcome, uh, I. 
I mean, my sole point was that when you talk about absolute truths, as soon as you contextualize them, they become less, they seem less absolute. And I do think that in many cases, they, oh well, they, they're not absolute. I don't believe in absolute uh, truths uh, in, uh, in, of any sort, let alone of, uh, uh, of ethical sort. How would I define essentially good or essentially bad? Yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean by essentially. Because if you, if you already assume that essentially means absolute, then if I started responding to your question, I'm already caught in your trap. Uh, but if you, mean, if you mean something looser, like how, how would I define um, a, a good or bad deed or action in... In, in this or that uh, uh, situation, well, there is a whole range of, uh, the I mean, ethical theories uh, to, to do this. Uh, where well, you can take the Kantian one, uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't require God, as we know from Kant. Uh, God is just a regulatory principle, so we just, as if it exists, that's sufficient. Or you can take the ontology, which is completely naturalized, or you can take uh, utilitarian, I mean, uh, this is a question of which ethical system uh, you choose. Uh, so let's assume that there is no uh, God or, uh, for you, Professor Gregorich, and uh, Professor Baker, you can assume there is a God. And uh, can you name one <coughs> moral value in today's Western society that is, I would say, uh, the highest principle in uh, comparing to the other values, or maybe uh, some not a uh, <coughs> moral value, but maybe some highest principle. How can we uh, define what is good or uh, what is uh, better to do in uh, today's society? I mean, this is an extremely general question. So you want you want one defining feature of Western societies that has a moral bearing. I don't know. It's respect for individual liberty, for instance. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I th that's it's a difficult question to to sort of single out one um, moral value and and say that it's higher than all the others. So on the Christian picture, um, a certain kind of love is extremely important, um, perhaps supremely important, um, namely self-giving love or agape, the kind of love that puts the other person first or self-sacrificial love, if you like. Um, and, um, and, the, and the Christian claim would be that the reason that that is, that, that it's not just free floating, it's, it's grounded in ultimate reality is this claim that God in God's self is an interpersonal community, three persons who exist from eternity in this relationship of self-giving love. And that, that's going to be the Christian metaphysical story about why that kind of love, agape, is supremely important. Okay, so <coughs> let me uh, repeat the question and uh, answer that I asked uh, earlier. So if we agree that there has been recently more progress, <laughs> And uh, if we believe that, uh, you know, more or less, we all try to live more, if, in more or less, right? And if we do that, and we generally, we would, most of us would agree about moral principles that we use to guide our lives. Uh, why do I, as a theist, need to invoke God to justify morality? To answer the questions, why morality and where from morality? And even deeper, to pose the question even deeper, if we have, you know, well, evolutionary psychology is not just so stories as Professor Gregory said. Uh, I agree. I agree there. So you know, if we have some scientific data that gives us, you know, um, explanation about the origins of morality, <clears throat> why should I, you know, satisfy with the divine mm. answers? Right. Well, this goes back to the distinction I drew earlier, which I think is a very important one between ex explanation and justification. So, and, and this goes for beliefs as well. So the, the fact that I can explain why someone has um, the belief that you know, dem democracy is a better way to govern countries. Suppose I can give a purely sociological explanation. Excuse me by interrupting you, just to make it short. Um, yeah. We all, you know, 
I am a philosopher by education. Yeah. And we sometimes use this thought experiments, but it goes, we stretch it just to show, you know, the, the little corners and the little blind mm. spots. But, you know, in general, we know what we want uh, from behaving moral. You know? We want to lead a better life. I want, I'm behaving moral towards him because I want him to feel better, mm. to be successful, yada, yada, yada. So, if we generally can find the explanation and if this behavior yeah. is not justified enough, why, why do I need that? I mean, is it not justified enough for me? Is, is there, is it, you know, my uh, intention to make my life good and the life of people around mm -hmm. me good not justified enough? Why do I need to, you know, involve God? Again, I'm a theist. So yeah. Day, yeah, sure. But I think you, you said like thought experiments shouldn't be used to kind of quibble about details, but I think this is important. Um, uh, yeah, I think that the, the, the distinction between explanation and justification is a really important one. It's not just a, a mere technicality. And, and the point is just that um, giving a causal story about why we believe something tells us nothing about whether we should have that belief or not. That, that's the point. I, I suppose I, I sort of want to shift the onus back onto you. Like, in general, there just is no good inference from, you know, we have this belief because of some, you know, causal factor too. Therefore, this is a belief we ought to have. Um, and so I think just merely pointing to causal stories about why we have empathy or why we, we seek flourishing um, don't give us... Um, a, an, a, an ethical justification in terms of why we ought to pursue those things. Just, just a short remark, I mean, uh, about this question. Uh, why we need moral, morality in general? It's not to live everyday life. <coughs> yeah. We can live everyday life on social norms and habit alone, but when we have exceptional Dilemma. dilemmas, that's when we need mm. morality, and that's when you said little, but those are the black spots. No. Well, I mean, I think in terms of why we need morality, I, I think what I'd say is we all already have certain moral commitments. There are, there are things we're all committed, we're probably in this room all committed to thinking genocide is wrong, despite the fact that some people have wanted to wipe out whole people groups. So then the question becomes then how do we make sense metaphysically of, of the status of that claim? That, that's what ethics is about. It's not about trying to describe causal processes and so on. But this is also about, so Max made a distinction, which is an important distinction between justification and explanation, but also it's about uh, what, how stringent criteria you put on justification. For Aristotle, for instance, just you, you don't ask beyond human flourishing, you don't ask why. I mean, if that's not clear to you that, that, that human flourishing is the ultimate why, the eudaimonia is the ultimate why, then you don't, you don't get his theory. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's, you know, you want more. Uh, and once you allow yourself more, of course you're going to go into, uh, into, the, into the direction of uh, theism and that sort of justification. Okay, um, I'm wondering about uh, the objective truths that you are mentioning. Um, are all of those truths um, exclusively anthropocentric or mm. can you please give us an example of one that yeah. is not? No, I don't think so. No, absolutely not. Um, I'm certainly not committed to the view that humans are the only thing in the universe that matter morally. And I think we probably agree on this. I think that non-human animals matter. Um, I think um, the non, I think non-human, even non-conscious aspects of the natural world matter morally. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, and of course this ties into the thought that we have ethical obligations to uh, look after the planet, not just insofar as it serves our interests as human beings, but insofar as uh, there is preciousness and, and, um, and I would say ethical value in, in aspects of the world that have nothing to do with us. Yeah. I ask you, Professor Verovich, uh, you said in the before that thou shalt not kill. Well, I think self-defense is, I believe, agree with that. You, can, you, you could murder someone in self-defense, but I think that it should be Thou shalt not murder, and I consider murder murdering someone with malicious intent. I don't think I think that sh sh 
is a fruit. You should not murder someone with malicious intent. Okay, so you have the following scenario. So you find out that one person is intent on harming your child, right? And they are, I don't know, you have uh, as solid proof as you can get that this is going to happen and that this person is going to, I don't know, uh, uh, take your child captive and so on and so on and I don't know. Uh, well, in that case, uh, is it is is it justified? Well, I, depends. Uh, I suppose not because you have a legal system to which you can uh, maybe appeal to. But you see, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that uh, you can you can you can always somehow unhinge uh, the seeming absoluteness of these imperatives, uh, and then. You're on a, on a real, uh, you have a real moral dilemmas. This is, uh, I saw recently a film in which um, it's called The Place. Uh, I wholeheartedly recommend it to all philosophers in this room uh, by Sorrentino, uh, in which uh, there is a guy who seems to be some devil's agent who. Um, fulfills wishes. So you come with whatever wish you want and he gives you what you need to do for that. Some of his, uh, some of his propositions are, most of them are immoral, but some of them, I mean, you can see some justification in, in doing. And the whole point of the film is that you yourself are then racked over what what is the right thing, what would be the right thing uh, to do. And what seemed to, be, to you to be unassailable uh, principle, now you tend to think twice. And just to finish up, uh, I think that uh, our moral intuitions are honed uh, by these moral dilemmas and we should engage them, we shouldn't fear them. Uh, and I don't think that you know, uh, if they remain unsolved uh, or if they still make you uncomfortable, uh, that's a good sign. In closing uh, this debate, uh, allow me one personal remark as a philosopher of science. Namely, uh, we philosophers of science well known that things can work without knowing the rational justification they are explainable but not justified enough. Uh, I hope that the same thing is also with morality. Uh, I wish to thank our debaters and also the organizers and you, the audience. Thank you very much.